Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Delusions of Grandeur. I'm your host, David Streggy, and here in the room with me, I have returning uh, Dane Kyle. Hello, Dane. Hello. Greetings from the darkness. <laughs> so tonight's pre-show is uh, about a 2007 film called uh, Pathfinder, uh, which uh, I chose because it had somewhat of a um, a caveman feel to it, at least to me, um, to go with our um, main event uh, f uh, film that will be going on uh, with after uh, 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 this. So, ladies and gentlemen, pardon my uh, burping, <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, uh, so let me um, just uh, start uh, start here by uh, saying what uh, IMDb says about this uh, uh, film, and then we'll go with first impressions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, a Viking boy is left behind after his clan battles a Native American tribe. Raised within the tribe, he ultimately becomes their savior in a fight against the Norsemen. So, um, Dane, uh, why don't you tell me um, a little bit? Uh, now, this was your first experience with the film, correct? Yes, it was. I well, I had always seen the the poster and the you know Blu-ray cover, and I always thought it looked cool. Um, I heard negative things about it, so it wasn't. Um, you know, it, it wasn't, and it also was not like a big hit or anything, so it wasn't really high on my priorities list. But, um, you know, I like um, period films, and I like um, the fact that, you know, this is kind of a neat what if story as far as, um, you know, um, indigenous, um, I guess on a more broad level, indigenous North Americans, because technically, um, the Vikings that landed in real life, uh, like Leif Erikson, they landed in what is now present day Newfoundland in mm -hmm. Canada. So technically it's indigenous Canadians versus, um, uh, Vikings, you know, that, that sounds like a neat idea. Um, and it's kind of like, um, there's that Nicholas Cage movie, uh, outcast where he and Hayden Christensen are crusader knights who desert, um, their army and they head east to China. Um, and, you know, I thought, oh, that's kind of neat. You know, it's it wasn't like an amazing film or anything, but it's like same kind of off the wall um, type of subject. Um, and yeah, so the film itself, I think, you know, Marcus Nispel is a very gifted visual director. Um, you know, it looks beautiful. Um, I think it's funny that it came out a month after 300 um, because it did have a very strongly 300 feel to it. Um, I don't think either film is especially great in the script department. Um, you know, it, uh, I, I would argue, I don't think that uh, 300 had a really good script, but it had a better script than this one did, which is not to say that this one was necessarily bad in and of itself it was just to me it was very kind of half-baked in the sense that we it wasn't paced especially well because like there's a lot of pretty much non-stop action and as we get going um and then only in the second half does it begin to slow down and do we feel like we start to have some characterization um especially with our our main hero he um you know, he feels like in the first half, he and the other characters, in the first half, uh, the script seems to not really show us a lot of really telling characterizations through behavior. It feels like we kind of have to be told what those characterizations are through kind of character types rather than uh, being shown in action, you know, what these people do and i and i don't mean like the non-stop action sequences which again they kind of litter the first half of the movie um you know are they they're they're good scenes but there's just too many of them back to back without having done the necessary pre-work to build up to them um and the uh but once we get to the second half and things kind of start to slow down and uh you know things get more focused um especially with 
the um, scene where he's leading the Vikings to try and find another occupied uh, village. You know, I feel like there you start to see real characterization there because you see his, uh, you know, ability to be crafty and to lead them into traps and, you know, some things work out, some things don't. And, you know, you, you see more of a character there than was the, in the first half. And um, so, yeah, I think visually it was stunning and I really love period films and especially ones that are a little bit more off the wall conceptually. But I do think, I think it's in a similar um, category of film as 300, which, you know, it's like, it's a beautiful looking film, definitely worth watching for learning about composition and things like that, um, if nothing else. But it's not going to be amazing in the script department in the way that it could have been um one of the things that really stuck out to me that 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 well one of the things i really liked and then one of the things i really didn't like i like the fact that the vikings consistently speak in old norse uh in that language i think that's a really great touch um but one of the things i didn't like was that our main heroes our main indigenous heroes they speak english and to me that was very jarring um it could be perhaps that I'm so used to, well, it could be perhaps that I'm so used to, um, subtitled see, films be well, narrow. I, I'm, I'm so used to like it being done really well with like, say, um, the passion of the Christ or especially <clears throat> apocalypto, um, you know, which are in languages that people don't speak anymore these days. And the actors, who are not native speakers of those languages, they had to make sure, you know, that they were saying these words uh, correctly. And, you know, they had to be, you know, had had their lines spelled out phonetically and everything. Um, and, you know, Mel Gibson had a great attention to detail with both of those films to do that. And it seemed like they did for the Vikings, but I just feel like they could have done that also for the indigenous characters and it's not like uh we don't have plenty of um indigenous uh canadians or indigenous americans that are in that same you know geographic region like around vermont or something um it's not like we don't have people who would know what those languages are such that they could you know educate the cast enough um yeah, and it's like if, wolves that shit yeah well and it's Get like if there. you if you did it for the Vikings consistently, and I think very well, then why couldn't you do it for the characters who belong to a group of people who still speak some I, version of this language? I actually think the reason why he might have done, uh, done it in English uh, for uh, for the main reason is that, uh, well, for one, to, uh, for us to understand it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, number two, um, I think... Uh, English is also um, might have be, uh, uh, been an easy way, way to, uh, for you know for uh, for us to distinguish that okay they're speaking a different language than the Vikings are. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know? would argue it would have made more sense to have the Vikings speaking English though. Uh, I, well, I, I'm I'm such a fan of. Oh, I feel uh, that it's for so, sure, well, but it's I'm so, just saying you know so, I think it would have uh, been less jarring. Yeah, well, it's so um, it's such a rare thing when you see any film that really does its homework with dialect and with vocabulary and la let alone language. Um, you know, like it's okay if you're dealing with like the American Revolution or even um, you know William Shakespeare, like Elizabethan England, because they're they're speaking in there. They would be speaking early modern English, which is. You know, you have some more formal language, but it is the same version of language that we're speaking right now. Um, <laughs> as a, as opposed to, you know, if you were to do something in Old English or Middle English, uh, let alone, you know, Old Norse or, you know, any number of languages that you could have put in there. Um, you know, I just, I, I'm a big fan when they do their research and when they 
reflect those things accurately, mostly because they don't do it anywhere near as much as I'd like them to. And I get why it's because it's for commerciality's sake and for the ease of the audience to understand and relate to these people and to, and to alienate them from the villains and all that. Uh, It is always a treat though, when they do it for sure. Exactly. And that's why I cite, that's why I always cite Mel Gibson because I feel like out of all of the people who have made period films, you know, he had the daunting task twice over of making, you know, films that are in lots of, you know, dead languages or languages that are only like partially known. And they kind of had to make educated guesses to fill in the gaps. Um, You know, and he did that twice over with two very, very different cultures and very different languages. Um, And especially with something like Apocalypto, which really didn't have any uh, established stars that um, Westerners would know. And, uh, you know, in a language that, you know, because people, you know, Latin's a dead language, but it has influenced English so much and people still study it. People in the West don't really study Mayan. Um, you know, so I think that's, that's like a big achievement there. So it can be done and it can be done well. Um, it I actually just argue in like this particular case, it makes <laughs> more sense to have the white dudes speak in English. You know, <laughs> if you're, if yeah. you're gonna, if you're gonna pick and choose there, you know, yeah, I mean, just give I... them Norse accents or whatever, but the natives, <laughs> yeah. come on, like I'm they could have easily really a, done that. I'm not really a fan of you know, again, um, but I'm, I'm weird about that. I don't think most people really care. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think there was that, but also, um, in terms of pacing, we really don't get to know anybody. We just kind of are told some basic character traits by analogy until we get to the second half when we start to feel like the story you know, that the more focused story really begins and we start to see characterization in action. Um, and that's more, because I, I like the fact that it was very heavily visual. You know, I thought that was good. That There, that, were, there were a lot of visual uh, uh, things uh, 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 going on. Uh, yeah. but I'd like to hear Mo's first uh, impressions before we get any further, if that's mm-hmm. okay. Uh, Mo, um, what was your first impression of this film when you first saw it? Oh, I loved it, dude. First time I saw it was, like, back when it was newer. And I think I rented it, like, three times or something like that. Like, I liked it enough it was an immediate repeat rent, you know. Uh, And I I feel like there was a few good movies like this around that time. Or maybe I'm thinking of, like, years differently. But I feel like that one other movie where that, I think it was called Outlander. Where that dude has to fight that dragon or whatever with, like, more primitive people. And he's, like, some space dude or some shit. Oh, are you thinking uh, of John Carter? I, I, I don't know if that's the dude that's in it, but I remember it coming out, like, I feel like it was around the same time as Pathfinder. Oh, and then there uh, was, like, one other movie that was kind of Viking-ish that also the came 13th, out. The, the 13th Warrior. 13th Warrior. I think that might have been a few years earlier, but yeah, I mean, I always love shit like this, where it's, like, probably because of Dances with Wolves, where it's, like, somebody out of their p- culture... Be, mm-hmm. Or like Last Samurai, I really liked that movie. So yeah, I went into that's, this. That's like, my favorite of those kinds of films. The Last of the Mohicans, too. So yeah, anything where it's like somebody like stranded out of their culture and another culture and like adapting to it, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm down with that. And yeah, I feel I mean, like this was a pretty decent story as far as that's concerned. I also feel like it came out shortly after like. Discovery Channel and stuff like that were starting to do a bunch more stuff on the whole like Vikings supposedly settling over here and stuff at one point and it was like I feel like there was a whole thing around that so I was pretty primed for Pathfinder and I think it it delivered for sure it's just a fun movie man you know yeah it's it's fun I I don't think I, I think it had same with 300 I think they both had potential to be better than they were but what was yeah there was i feel not, that. What, what was there was not unserviceable but uh especially not in the visual department like they were both spectacular to look at you know and you have people that are really visually gifted uh behind the camera in both of those films um 
you know, but I, I, I have seen examples of like, again, looking at something like Apocalypto, you have this really visually stunning film that also has good character set up in terms of action and how characters behave in situations. They set that up quickly and effectively to where when the bad stuff goes down, we know who people are and, you know, care about them. And, and they had the attention to detail with the language and with, um, you know, especially portraying a non European culture, you know, it was, I think, pretty stunning. Um, so, I mean, it can, you can have your cake and eat it too on that one. <laughs> uh, me, um, I believe I first came across, uh, uh, I mean, I think it was, I had a theatrical run. I'm not re uh, really sure whether it did or didn't. Yeah, it did. Uh, I, I believe that it, di uh, it did. Um, I, I didn't see it in the theater, but I did um, buy it and re rent it from Blockbuster, and uh, I didn't have a problem with uh, with, uh, with the script. I felt like the story was uh, uh, was being fleshed out as it was going, because you, you got those flashbacks of uh, hit, well, actually, it, it wasn't a flashback at first. It was actually him as a a little kid and he was he he saw basically the slaughter of this people and mm -hmm. uh, he was the survivor uh, well he wasn't the survivor he, he was a survivor of the vikings that landed there mm -hmm. <laughs> um and uh, his father wanted him to be something he was not and, and then of course he grew up underneath the guidance of the of the tribe that found him and uh, he had to find his own way. What I did like about the uh, uh, film myself is that his relationship with that one tribal um, leader um, uh, that ultimately in death showed him his true pathway. Mm. So, uh, so, and you saw that throughout when, when he was first told that in the tent, uh, 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 like, when he was when he was in a ceremony with that other dude who went and went with his own tribe and he was told he wasn't wasn't ready yet you know so yeah i mean russell means plays his usual russell means type character but he does that very well um i liked uh i like moon blood good as the uh leading lady i thought she actually had some good um you know, uh, scenes and good moments to shine. And I like that she became the, um, the new Pathfinder at the end. You know, I thought that was good. Well, I feel like they all, uh, well, they both were kind of like the a Pathfinder. Yeah, they he, were. He, uh, he, uh, the Russell Means uh, c uh, character, um, he um, said um, to him at one point in time, whether it was in a dream or something like that, where, where there are always two sides to a sword, mm -hmm. which which meant uh, uh, that uh, uh, evidently his better half, his other half, female, was uh, was like his second warrior or what or whatever. And I liked how they uh, they, they kind of banded together at the uh, in like the, that final battle. <laughs> yeah, where. Um, you know, it was almost like watching like uh, Gimli and uh, and uh, what whatnot in uh, in Lord of the Ri Rings. With uh, you know, where, where one had arrows, one uh, one had a spear. You know, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. But uh, but um, uh, Mo, um, what did you think about the the story uh, line of of uh, this Pathfinder um, uh, as he went through his journey? I mean, I thought it was okay. I'd probably agree with Dane that maybe it, it lacks a little bit. And I mean, it could have been a bigger story. You know, yeah, they could have fleshed a lot of the stuff out more. They didn't full on dances with wolves your ass and like make the movie stupid long. And uh, yeah, which I'm know. not even asking for that. I'm more just asking for because uh, even like Apocalypto, it's not all that long of a film. Um, no, but it's properly paced, and you get just the right degree of characterization when you need it um because like honestly like for most of this movie like it's not even all that long a movie but it felt very long un until 
you got to that part. It, once they get to, you know, show us where the village is and he's leading them throughout the wilderness, like that could have been the movie, you know, that journey. And I think it actually would have been more satisfying because that's where you really feel like the true character is coming out. Um, I do want to say through his director, behavior. I do want to say who the director was. Uh, the director was Marcus Nispel. And before we go even further, we are going to spoil the shit out of this movie. So, <laughs> um, and I guess he's from Germany, but uh, and he's actually the director of uh, the Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre um, remake. Um, the, uh, the and after this, he directed the. Friday the 13th remake as well, and Conan the Barbarian remake, and uh, that Exeter um, um, Exorcist movie. That was actually pretty damn good. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> I haven't seen that one, but so... those other remakes are by far not the worst ones. So, <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to say that uh, before we moved on uh, even f uh, uh, further. So, what do I you don't think know, about? Man. Uh, like I was saying, I was pretty fucking hyped on this maybe when I first saw it. So I rode that hype train all the way through the thing. Like that trailer just talking about, you know, like the Vikings landed and such and such. What made them leave? Like mm -hmm. it just, it, it fired me up, man. So all I really wanted to see was like Vikings fighting natives, you know? I and... wanted to see action too. And it, it brought, it brought that. And it also brought that mysticism of the in, of the magic of, the spirit of Indians, you know? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, he, he, it was pretty well balanced as far as all that goes. I mean, I, I guess they could have fleshed some stuff out a little bit better, but I, I think it pretty much delivered what I was expecting, so. Oh, and that's, that's good. I just, I've for me personally, I've seen it done. Like, it hits all those beats, but it also hits okay. the other beats as well. So I'm, I'm saying you can have it both ways, but the... Um, I think that oh, the, sure. the strongest things about it are the visuals, are the, um, you know, they're, they're, it's a it's a visually rich film, and also, like, I thought Moon Blood Good did a good job, Russell Means did a good job, um, Carl Urban, that was one of his earlier big films, as I recall, that was before, um, actually, I think he was in Lord of the Rings before that, but he... Um, oh, okay. This is well, post bad wig and Lord of the Rings. That's yeah, like, it's post <laughs> post that, but pre uh, Star Trek, where he was Bones. Um, then the Kelvin timeline of Star Trek. Um, you know, so interesting little thing there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think the score could have been better. Like it's, that's one of the things I love about um, kind of epic period films is that the scores tend to be really good or at least they have a higher probability of being good than non-period epic films do. And uh, I feel like the score could have been a little better. Um, it wasn't overly memorable, and that's actually one of the things that I particularly loved about the film we'll talk about later tonight, uh, Quest for Fire. The score was incredible in that film. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, so, I can't say it led the score for this one left any kind of impression on me. I don't yeah, remember it which, one way or the it, other. So even three hundred, which had kind of a more um electronically infused score. I don't really put this in the level of three hundred because the three hundred three hundred I put more in the level of the uh, the series Spartacus. Uh, well, uh, in terms of that, you know, time period and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's closer for sure. It's close, but the uh, but the way they did the slow motion action mm -hmm. was not on the level of the, uh, uh, this film. Um, yeah, this this thankfully did not do the same 300 thing of the zooming in to... Uh, and using the slow motion and then zooming back out like they didn't or stopping and starting like they didn't do that. You know, they did their own thing in terms of being able to show action play out in a smooth way, um, which, again, with um, The Passion of the Christ did that really well. Like, I think for for that film, it was more consistent because normal scenes um, were shot at. I believe, like, 
I want to say that normal scenes were shot at like maybe 29 frames per second instead of 24 for the most part, and then played back at, you know, 24 frames per second. So they looked a little smoother. Um, and, you know, and that was just for most kind of normal scenes, not so even scenes of like noticeable slow motion, which is a lot of that film, but it also just goes to show that you can kind of take that and go all the way with it i know i'm going to be honest uh, I, I, i've seen a lot of biking films and i have never seen um uh a dude sledding on a, sh- a shield while vikings in full full metal uh you know the whole suit and armor shit uh, shit i've never see, uh, seen uh, them on sleds side by side uh, 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 like bobsledders you know before uh, yeah. as, as I, w- I would imagine that that scene would have been hard to do especially with, with that uh, fucking uh, metal spike ball that he was th- trying to throw at, at at him and how it hit him several well at least hit, hit his shield or whatever he was on a couple of times <laughs> yeah I, I kind of was when I saw that I was like there's going to be a certain amount of the audience that thinks this is really cool. And then there's going to be a certain amount of the audience that's going to think this is really dumb. Kind of like the shield surfing in the two towers. Um, you know, it's like, again, they're going to think that's either really cool or really dumb. And I was kind of in the really dumb category, but it, um, you know, it wasn't like, you know, totally jumping the shark, but it was, something that I, I could tell that they were trying to do something that a film like that hadn't done before. And indeed they did it, but, you know, for, did it necessarily pay off or did it necessarily build up to that sufficiently? I don't, I think they might've played their Trump card a little too early. I actually did like the um, kind of the fight on the side of the mountain with the uh, ropes and everything. I think that was a well conceived. I like different scene. mountains. That uh, that evidently the tribes could go to. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, e- each place was a little bit different. Yeah. You know, uh, e- even though they were similar in in build in, in, in of the rock, you know, you you had the uh, the one where the bear was, mm-hmm. uh, and that bear looked fucking real. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it. Uh, you know, if there's one thing you know about. Um, Canada's uh, topography, you know, it has, even to this day, most of it is unspoiled, uh, largely because, well, there's a lot of it, and most of it is not ideal for human habitation. Um, But as a result of that, their natural beauty has not been spoiled in the way that it has here. Um, And uh, you notice that there's a lot of different types of environments in the, that part of the world um, as far as like uh, kind of thick forests and then tundra and mountains and some parts have the prairie, other parts have kind of the sunnier weather like Vancouver. Um, you know, you got a lot of different, uh, you know, types of landscapes there. And even within the particular region that they're supposed to be in at that point in time around Newfoundland, what we would call Newfoundland nowadays. Um, and uh, th- there were a couple of things I was a little curious about. So I know for a fact that up until, um, well, for sure, in the post Columbian era, um, I know that after that point, horses got introduced onto the North American continent when they weren't there before. I do not know if Vikings themselves had horses um, that I don't know. I know, obviously, they were uh, primarily seafaring people, um, you know, that was like their way of life. But um, as far as like whether or not they had done that, I I don't know. I would have to check on that. Um, But I was sort of like, yeah, I don't know. I did find it funny that our main hero, uh, that he that he somehow knew how to ride a horse despite there not being any horses natively in North America at that time. I mean, maybe he rode the sun when he was a kid, but, you know, even then that's not terribly clear. And same with, um, 
I did find it funny that he's really good at sword fighting and is fluent in Old Norse despite not having spoken it for like 15 years or whatever. Um, you know, you would wonder if he got rusty, you know. Um, <laughs> I did find that amusing. But um, as far as like whether or not they would have known how to ride horses and brought them with them on a big journey like that, I don't know. I did bring up 300 just because the characterization of the Vikings themselves is very similar to the um, the Persians in 300 in the sense that, yes, there's a historical basis, but it's filtered through such a kind of fantastical lens that you kind of have to take it with several heaping grains of salt. Um, but uh, again, it does yield very visually rich uh, storytelling there. So you know, it is a give and take, but I just, as a history buff, I like to sort of ask myself, okay, could this conceivably have happened? Uh, you know, there, <laughs> there's, there is so much about Vikings in um, modern Canada, or what we would call Canada today. You know, th there's so much about that that we still don't really know. Uh, we only know a little bit of when they would have made their first expeditions and you know the fact that they didn't really stay overly long not in the way of like you know the england and france and spain you know would have done in the you know the new world you know just staying there forever um you know so the, there's so much of it that we don't know from what i from what i think we do know i think that um do you the that a film, even if it's just an action film, is uh, uh, must be historically accurate? Uh, well, it's. I think that you have to ask, like, what's the. Uh, generally speaking, I do like it when people have done their homework um, when they're conceiving a story. Does it have to be like 100%? Not necessarily, because you look at something like Lawrence of Arabia, and that film is very kind of romanticized. It's not completely inaccurate to what happened, but it is through a very kind of romanticized lens. It's really more of an adaptation of the real T.E. Lawrence's Ten Pillars of Wisdom book, which was about his life. Um, and it's kind of that book, I guess, was written in a very romanticized way. Um, but it's like, but Lawrence of Arabia is one of the best films ever made, and it, uh, you know, it works as a movie uh, completely, and um, it's not like too far off the mark either. Um, I think that, um, and as much as I did praise the attention to detail with language and stuff in The Passion of the Christ and, Apoc and Apocalypto, um, one of the more glaring, uh, actually Braveheart is you know, great film, but it is pretty glaringly wrong in terms of, like, what the Scots would have worn at that time and um, character relationships and what those characters actually did versus what they didn't do in real life. You know, there, there's a lot of kind of noteworthy deviations there. I think that a film can be a good film just in and of itself, um, but it has to work as a movie you know, it, it does have to work as a movie because when it doesn't or when there are noticeable things that aren't gelling, then that's when you particularly start to notice some of the things that don't really line up. Um, but uh, I, I do think a, a good movie can be a good movie, even if it's not uh, quite, you know, historically <clears throat> accurate. Um, I do think that you can... Um, have your cake and eat it too in the sense that you can do your research do your homework and you can make a really good film that also does follow his history pretty accurately like a good example is like Tora 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 um you know that follows the Japanese and the American sides of uh what happened with Pearl Harbor you know and it, apparently it hits all of the um events pretty accurately when as to when things happened and how they happened and then, like, Captain Phillips, same thing. Um, now, granted, the advantage there is that those were in relatively recent history, and we have a lot of documentation to go off of, so it's a bit of a, a luxury there that we have as opposed to what we don't have with, you know, the Vikings having been in Newfoundland. Um, so, uh, yeah, to a certain extent, there you can take some creative license, but, 
you know, when it's more, when it flies in the face of some things that we know, you know, were or were not a certain way, and it's at the absence of, you know, making a story work on the page, then that's more when you notice it. Okay. Um, Mo, what what do you think? Uh, do you think that uh, film has to be historical for uh, for the sake of watching the movie? I mean, for me, it very much depends on a couple of different things. Like, is it based on an actual historical event or person? Mm-hmm. Uh, is it, you know, trying to be a period accurate film or is it just a period film that's, you know, meant to be a quick dose of fun with, like, you know, guys yeah. with swords and shit? Uh, a lot of this comes from watching a lot of samurai movies lately. Like some of the stuff they 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 fudge the fucking period a little bit with it, you know. Like there is certain elements of it where they'll tell you right there on the like commentary or you know interviews and stuff that yeah that actually was like not around till later, but we put it in there because it was cool. It depends mm-hmm. though, you know those types of samurai samurai films I'm watching are like Lone Wolf and Cub. They're just meant to be a quick blast of intense action that's set in the sort of the period, you know. Uh, and I, I think 300 is trying to be more of that type of thing, and I would argue that perhaps Pathfinder's trying to be that as well. Um, yeah, it's stylized know. sort of graphic novel vibe yeah. where it's just set in that period with cool sort of stuff from around the time, you know? Yeah. Like, they probably well, didn't have to, horses. Well, try to it, modernize it with, uh, with some stuff that would be cool, you know? Well, uh, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying that, you know? It's just... Uh, yeah, again, I've seen examples where you can have really good action sequences and you can have things more or less, you know, exist in the realm legit. of... yeah. Well, I, ki- I, I kind of, sort of exist in the realm of history. I mean, I 100% <laughs> agree. You can have your cake and eat it, too. It just all depends on if that's what they're trying to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> so, so if I were to make, like, a movie set in feudal Japan or something, like, I'm probably just making Lone Wolf and Cub. You, <laughs> you guys yeah. can make some fucking Jigadeki period piece thing if you want. I'm just going to slice dudes up. Yeah. Like that's that's what I'm I'm down for. So which, which it, it, be... it all depends on the person doing it too. I think if we look into this guy's history, like he pointed out all those remakes, and they're all pretty fun, slightly stylized remakes of movies that were pretty straightforward to begin with. So I don't know if fully doing that level of homework is necessarily in this guy's wheelhouse, you know. And that's that's a perfectly fair counter argument. The um the thing uh that I'll say in this movie's favor in comparison to something like 300, which I think stylistically it's, it's, and the fact they came out so close to each other and their directors came out of the music video and commercial world. And it's like, you know, oh, shit. Well, that, there you go. There's, well, there's a lot of uh, similarities there stylistically, but um, one thing I will say in this movie's favor in comparison to 300 is that this film takes place during a time where we really don't know a whole lot about what went on um, and what, you know, I, I think we know that at least with like some of the in- native inhabitants of like Greenland and, you know, different parts of like around Hudson Bay, um, you know, that the Vikings, I think were pretty friendly with them, but, you know, then again, the Vikings were very brutal seafarers. So, you know, they could have had some skirmishes like this, you know, um, uh, I'm well, assuming... the, the, the fact that we don't know, we're able to then fill in the gaps a little bit easier as opposed to... I can to, buy it. As I think friendly the with the Vikings is like a relative term. You know, that just means <laughs> they're not killing you always, you know? Exactly. Well, in 300, you know, the difference there is that we, that's a historical event. We have Herodotus, you know, the historian who told us about it. You know, we we have other corroborating pieces of evidence to it, and we know more about the Greeks and the Persians, uh, or the Spartans specifically, we know more about them uh, in more detail than we do about the people and period in this film. And wow. so thus, thus when you, you know, have a Xerxes that doesn't look even remotely like the real historical Xerxes, you know, it, uh, it does... I like that kinky one. <laughs> You like the uh, kind of androgynous, yeah. abnormally, <laughs> got it, dude. abnormally deep voice, kind of almost yes. alien-looking thing. All of it, all the weirdness, just <laughs> with bring all it the on. piercings. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 
But anyway, I'd yeah, I think the, the that. ambiguity, I think, is whenever you have that, you know, you can more easily connect the dots. I don't know. Um, the show Vikings, uh, 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 that humanized the, uh, the sure. Vikings for me a little bit, uh, a little bit, a bit uh, to where, where I don't think that the Vikings always just killed, 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 you know, uh, 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 just, uh, just we're hey, all about okay. Hey, killing. I understand that they aren't the stereotype that we think of them as. It's just more <laughs> fun to think of them that way, dude. It is, it is fun to think of them as just these killing machines. You I know? like the Amon or Marth fucking, you know, melodic death version of Vikings where they're just <laughs> out there sailing and fucking killing and shit. <laughs> just not giving a fuck who the fuck they kill just so long just as they giving talk. dudes blood eagles and shit. <laughs> but, um... Uh, and, and that's kind of what uh, the Viking that, uh, that is kind of portrayed here. I mean, they're all in black. It's black me metal. Uh, the, the battle axes look, look wicked, you know. I, I will give give him a, a, him the benefit of the doubt for making uh, making the costumery of the Vikings look wicked as all fuck. I mean, there was one of the guys, he actually had a skull over his fucking face, you know, mm -hmm. a skull ma a mask, which uh, kind of reminded me of like Turbo Kid a little bit, just a little bit, not much, just a little bit. Well, but... it's cool to think of that in the sense that like, <laughs> maybe they were doing it to play up how the natives might've perceived them and just their, you know, like just even if they were wearing standard Viking shit, but with like armor and maybe some ornaments and things that Vikings wore, I they might look fucking scary and like weird monsters to the natives you know because it went into the costumery of the of, of the vikings <laughs> well, i mean uh i know that it's a i mean again there i know that in the costume uh department that they were trying to make it more deliberately stylized and they did that was one of the stronger aspects of it you know how cool the armor looked um, I do know that in real life, um, real Viking helmets didn't have horns, uh, that that was a, a myth because of the fact that they were so brutal, you know, that they were perceived to be kind of devil-like, um, you know, so in that respect, you know, because of the kind of monstrous aspects of these particular Vikings, they they look very monstrous and behave in such a way to, you know, reflect that perception mm -hmm. and if if you're going for a more stylized uh, film set in a particular time and place, then it's certainly, um, I think that was one of the more effective uh, things about it, for sure. Um, so, um, are there any other characters that uh, that uh, we should talk about before we uh, before we talk about? Uh, I mean, we we've somewhat talked about. Have we somewhat talked about the special effects? Um, I mean, I think it was not even so much, I mean, you had like your kind of standard slasher movie gore effects there, but like, it was more but, the visuals of the landscape, um, uh, an outer lens fo uh, focus uh, of like uh, some uh, the way, uh, way the Vikings were portrayed. I yeah. mean, I did like uh, the fact that we got to see some of the Indian graveyards, you know, uh, oh, where, where the, uh, you know, where they apparently buried their dead. Th th those were kind of cool. Yeah. Well, I, I think and later on, pets that they wanted to resurrect, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I think it wasn't really so much about visual effects in the way that we're thinking of. Uh, it's just more so in the way of being really, really strategic and smart with your lighting, your colorizing, uh, your color correction after the fact. Um your how you choose to shoot a scene, what speed, what um, frame rate you're at, um, you know, all those different things that not so much an effect as much as just good technique, and uh, that right, can, right. that can create an effect, but it, like on more the audience, of a but it's cinematography not, thing. Yeah, the... like it can create an effect on the audience, but it's not a special effect. Right. There's arguably effects. more physical effects like that in. Quest for Fire. Which yeah. Well, I mean, there they kind of had to because, you know, they didn't have CGI. But, and actually, uh, Pathfinder, it is stylized and it does look stylized, but it also, you can also tell that they shot more in real places with real things as opposed <laughs> to like with 300, which, as beautiful as it looks 
and it's and it does like it, it looks like a moving painting in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, they did shoot just about all of it, I think, on green screen, um, which again for the kind of thing it was going for was fine because it was it looked like Frank Miller's original comic book, um, and uh, you know replicated that style very faithfully. Um, I do think that again with this film you were able to have a very clear stylization but you also were able to be in more real places which was nice <laughs> so um ultimately uh, uh, Lee, um uh, did um let's see did, we talked about uh, about uh, sp- uh, now we talked about the practical f- uh, actually we didn't um uh, what did you think about the practical effects in this film uh, mo oh i would very much agree like it's a uh... It's more in the cinematography and stuff. Other than that, it's kind of got, I, I suppose, the standard stuff that you would, you'd want in this kind of a movie. You know, uh, <laughs> it's it relies more on like just sort of the style and the action, really. If you think about it, than it does like a bunch of splatter. I actually kind of forgot how much of that was in Quest for Fire. You know, <laughs> uh, well, the, I just. Uh, there wasn't really that much splatter in this film. It was more or le- uh, less right. the, uh, uh, the sudden... Um, I mean, th- uh, there were some interesting deaths. Um, what did you think about the uh, tribe that just went and killed itself? <laughs> Either one of hey. you. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta check out, man. Fuck it. Oh, you mean <laughs> that when they, when they fell into the trap? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was, that was, I, I found that kind of um, amusing just because, like, on the one hand, um, see, again, this is an example of characterization in action as opposed to having been told that this person is a certain way. Um, you see this person um, clearly trying to outsmart his captors and for the most part doing a good job at it, but what I liked about that scene was the fact that even, you know, not to be too punorific, but even the the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. And uh, it most certainly did in that um, particular scene, because, you know, you can plan ahead as much as you can, but at the end of the day, there's still that kind of blind chance that will get in the way. Uh, and I think that was a a neat kind of reversal on our expectations. Okay. Um, well, um, and we talked about uh, somewhat of mu- uh, music. I didn't really uh, uh, see uh, or hear uh, much of the music to really uh, to, uh, to really identify it as anything myself. Yeah, I mean, it's there. You know, it is. Yeah, there. Yeah. And it, is it wasn't there. wasn't really memorable, and I think that's that's one of my favorite aspects of period. No one's films, running out and it? buying it on vinyl anytime soon. You know? Nah. <laughs> That Quest for Fire, now that had a good score. That'd be a sexy vinyl. It was by John Elias, which apparently he did some of the soundtrack behind Watchmen. Mm-hmm. Dude, fucking Quest for Fire soundtrack on vinyl with like flame colored fucking, you know, color disc. Oh man. That'd be cool. That was um, neat. I was just looking at uh, seeing what, uh, what he might have done. Uh, uh, oh, he did the music. Uh, 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 he was the composer to Leprechaun 2. <laughs> kind of a noticeable shift there between the and two. <laughs> children had the resume a little bit, though. And the children of the corn movie later on. So mm-hmm. uh, well, the, then, it, then again, John John Debney, who did um, the Passion of the Christ score and got an Oscar nomination for it, he also did you know like a lot of like comedy scores and a lot of just other random things, and you know, so it's not everyone goes on to kind of cannibalize themselves musically like Hans Zimmer. Um, you know, they do try to branch out and do other things. Okay. Um, what about um, favorite scenes for all of you guys? Hmm. It's a good question. <laughs> the pro- problem is that a lot of the scenes just kind of ran together and at least in the first half i was just like can we just stop and take a breather for a second here you know uh and kind of figure out what is going on 
<laughs> well, and not not, not what's well, actually not what's going on, but like rather what is going on and how is it affecting these people that I still don't really know all that well. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I think the climax is pretty solid as far as um, you know a fight on the on a cliffs on a cliff face. You know, that's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, always oh. a good time. Uh, what was your favorite scene? If you could take something from this particular film, I mean, from memory, probably that, like Saint okay. Martin's Dane. Cumul- oh, cumulatively, cool. it's an enjoyable movie. You know? I would have to go with several uh, scenes because I, I guess now thinking about about it, uh, thinking about some of the things that Dane sees, uh, 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 I guess it somewhat takes some of the, uh, <laughs> shall I say salt from my eyes but uh <laughs> took a little <laughs> magic away a little bit of magic away but <laughs> um um i i kind of like the romantic little sex scene that, that goes on between uh, oh, uh about to go on moon and, uh, him it's kind of romantic i mean it's got it, it, i mean it, it, he's uh making love to her underneath that rock face i mean uh, that whole setting right there is just uh, uh, like if i if i were there with some hot chick that's the kind of setting that I would love. It's well, definitely kinda... more romantic than that campfire scene in Quest for Fire, man. That's but... true. Well, but I like the fact that that scene was very not romantic. It was very animalistic del- deliberately. Um, but yeah, the she uh... taught him a lesson later, you know. Yeah. Well, the 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 it, but again, it makes sense because they're primitive humans. You know, they're like one step away from yeah. being in the jungle. But like. Um, the uh, yeah, that particular scene it kind of reminded me in a way of the waterfall sex scene in Braveheart. Um, and in in both films, I have to say, aren't you guys like freezing your asses off because <laughs> Canada, Canada's cold, Scotland's cold. It's like, and you're like not oh, even cuddled like, under the well, under the the animal skin blankets oh. or anything. <laughs> you know, it's like you would you would need a lot more, uh, you know layers of warmth in order to to do that i should think it wouldn't look good on camera but you know in real life it's like you would have to get several layers of uh of blankets before you can even think about that sort of thing <laughs> yeah yeah that's definitely true um on, uh, i think the uh, the next scene that uh, that uh, I, I i would take from this is the underwater scene where uh, where he he sees the uh, uh, the russell means character and he <laughs> and he just appears to him uh, <laughs> and uh he basically tells him he's not done yet you know mm-hmm. uh, so for some reason, I I, I just always love uh, Native American like interpretation, like spirit walking kind of th- uh, thing. You know, I always uh, 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 th- uh, th- I always, always like to think that uh, Indians can actually spirit walk after they're dead, or or you know uh, they I, I like to think that they can go uh, go out, smoke up a, a joint, and and like walk out of their bodies and yeah i think if we sit in a sweat lodge and take enough peyote bro we could probably all do that i was gonna say uh, russell means was smoking something i, I don't think it was it, i don't think it was marijuana specifically because that's more of a south american thing natively um but you know it could have been some other kind of whatever other kind of hallucinogenic plant might grow around there <laughs> the death head shroom Anyways, <laughs> I still want to know if Fishhawk could power me up with a peace pipe like in Poltergeist too. You guys remember that? He <laughs> gives him the peace pipe power up, and later he blows it up that ghost. That's fucking awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, well, um, um, I think have we covered everything. Pretty much. Okay. Um, did anyone else have anything else to say about the film? Um, uh, did you have some unsaid words, uh, Mo, about the film? Before I mean, we... it's just, you know, solid, I guess. It fits the theme, for one thing. It is kind of ancient. Um, just solid, fun, sort of period action flick, man. Doesn't take itself too, too seriously. Uh, it's got a good vibe to it. Just watch the trailer, I would say. Like, cause that's what hyped me up on it back in the day. And I was like, sold, take my well, fucking money, you know? 
It's a, um, it's it's got to be, and you can dance to it. Me, I I still enjoy it. Um, I see your uh, uh, points, uh, uh, Dane, and I uh, and uh, uh, I'll have to think on what has been said. <laughs> I I'm not saying any of that to like take away enjoyment from anybody, and oh, if anything, right, right. uh, if anyone, if anything, if someone's wanting to. No learn how to uh, visually tell a story in a very stylized, rich way, uh, this would be a film that I would point them to um, for sure. Because there's a lot, there are a lot of films that I could point to that aren't necessarily amazing on the script, on the script level that I still think people should see for different reasons. And one of which is, you know, just studying shot composition and, you know, lighting and things like that. What you said about the subtitling uh, hits a, a little bit home. Uh, the, mm-hmm. uh, the the fact that uh, uh, the Vikings had subtitles and they didn't, you know. Yeah, so, uh, and I know uh, why. I know why that's there. Not just commerciality's sake, but also it kind of others the enemy for us and makes the um, the protagonist more relatable in that way. Um, I I hadn't really thought of it in that sense. I was just thinking of who it makes most sense to be speaking English. But yeah, yeah well, but I, 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 get, I think I get that's that what now. that that's what that effect is meant to do. I mean, it's a it's a subtle <laughs> it's a subtle thing, which um, yeah, othering you know, them. I like that. Yeah, which uh, I mean, as much as I really loved the attention to detail with um, the Passion of the Christ uh, language, now it's not perfect because. Um, Technically, the lingua franca at the time was classical Greek instead of Latin, even though, you know, Latin would have been spoken and it certainly, you know, the Romans certainly would have would have spoken it. But the more common language was classical Greek. And, um, you know, and they kept it with just the two languages because of the <laughs> but they, they had the distinctly different sounds to them. Uh, mm-hmm. which, they most, which they most definitely do. Um, when you hear them, you can tell what language is being spoken, and um, you know a good a good attention to, t- attention to detail there was um, when Jesus is being questioned by Pilate. Um, Pilate speaks to uh, Jesus in Aramaic initially, but then Jesus replies in Latin, um, kind of as a way to say that you know he's kind of beating him in his own game, pretty much. Um, I think you could have done something like that here, you know, where, you know, and again, the, the sound of old Norse is very distinct. Um, and it most certainly (laughs) would have, it most certainly would have been clearly distinguishable from the language of that particular tribe. Um, because native American languages, uh, do not sound at all like, uh, European originated languages. And so (laughs) I, I think you definitely could have had a distinct sound and you could have told you know you could have been able to tell you know what language that was and it would have had the same kind of effect yeah but i mean it's it's like was mentioned earlier too i I think that would have alienated a good portion of the audience for this shit too most likely because people don't as much as i love them i love seeing people speak their native languages and seeing the mouth just match i don't even care what language it is you know yeah Um, and i and i get it it's the target audience probably some people will not fucking watch fully subtitled movies (laughs) like they just won't you know yeah and i can see in a in a sense i still catering dumb but you know it is um, but i can see how some of these guys feel the need to cater to that and, 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 so you... here and tell you exactly why she doesn't like reading shit <laughs> she doesn't like reading shit when she's supposed to watch it so <laughs> see I, maybe i'm biased because i've watched subtitled stuff for so long between like anime and, and samurai movies and things I'm like that too. that I, i'm so used to the sh- uh, shit uh, yeah. t- uh, t- i could i could watch it just like uh, like any of you. Yeah, I don't even notice yeah. that I'm reading it. Like it just well, I, happens. But I love it too because especially like a good example of a film that everybody seems to love, which is Inglorious Bastards. You've got you got English and you've got you know Brad Pitt's kind of garbled Southern English. Um, yeah, you've got um, French and you've got German, and all of them sound very very different and. Even the thing that you think is going to be a crippling contrivance 
when Hans Landa asks the um, the uh, guy in the French countryside to switch to English, you think that it's just for the benefit of the audience, but in fact it's to make sure that the Jews underneath the floorboards don't understand what they're saying, uh, <laughs> which I thought, now that is really clever. That's really smart. Um, you know, so again, you can make that an integral part of your story and still make it a story that the general public will see and will like. Okay. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for today, folks. So um, why don't we start with uh, a Udane, um, um, uh, uh, who are you and uh, where can we find uh, some of your stuff? Who am I? That's a great question. Well, um, am I? I am exactly. Uh, I am Dane Kyle. I'm an independent filmmaker out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm kind of getting myself reestablished in my new place with my new kind of living arrangements, and um, I'm going to be contributing to a brand new uh, YouTube channel. It's called. Um, it is called. Um, indie horror film creative it's brand new and uh set up by tony newton my good friend uh, from england and i'll be contributing um film reviews blu-ray collecting videos and then a series that i'm going to call uh no money film school which is where i having made you know some shorts and having contributed to features and things like that i'll be able to share some of my wisdom to the next generation without barring them from entry because of money or anything like that and if anything i'll be kind of trying to help them get their initial visions realized on little to no money um you know and just give them a decent founding in film theory and things like that um and i also keep them up to date about like as i continue to grow as a filmmaker myself that i'll be able to share whatever lessons i've learned with them along the way so that way you know they learn along with me that sounds fantastic dude mm -hmm. i'll definitely awesome. keep us posted on that oh Hello. yeah why don't you tell us a little about about yourself and what you do i'm mosley i do you know reviews of old movies for my channel drunken master studios occasional video game stuff not so much lately <laughs> uh everything that's going on it's hard for me to really de-stress enough to want to like just waste a bunch of time playing video games so i'm just on the movies which tends to be what i lean more towards anyways i'm doing a kaiju quarantine thing where i'm reviewing a bunch of japanese <laughs> monster movies so be sure to come check that out i also got some reviews for like newer horror films that i've been watching out of the backlog and i'm going to be continuing my lone wolf and cub series alongside the kaiju flicks here real soon so I uh, look forward to that. Also, be sure to sub up Rebel Gaming Club. It's been a little while since I've done videos with them, but uh, definitely going to be getting back to that soon. You guys should just check that out anyways if you want like a weekly video game thrifting sort of pickup show. Awesome. And my name is David Streggy. I uh, am one of the founding fathers of Inside Movies Lore, as well as a um, uh, founding father of Delusions of Grandeur, which is uh, uh, what we are uh, we're, we're talking on now. And uh, what I do on Delusions of Grandeur is I do pick up videos and video reviews of my own. So uh, definitely check some of the, uh, those out. I have had, uh, had the chance to speak to several um, directors uh, as of late. You can find some of those uh, uh, interviews on the channel and uh, Afterwards, we are going on about a Back to Caveman Days kind of a film, and even further behind dialogue, so uh, in Quest for Fire, so stay tuned for that, and uh, definitely enjoy this film if you have not uh, uh, seen it. At least give it a one-time uh, one, uh, one watch, if not more. I certainly enjoy enjoy the film. I look past uh, 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 some of the things we have talked about today. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, don't let that uh, spoil it for you. So, stay tuned for more fun and excitement as yeah. we can watch that shit. Listen to Quest for Fire by Iron Maiden, and then listen to our Quest for Fire discussion. Definitely, man. Alrighty.